whatever the situation is today, our God is still on the throne. Our God is on the throne. He reigns. He's sovereign, and He rules. He's in control. He is rich in mercy. He's rich in His love, and rich in His compassion for us. So let us come together. Let us unite our hearts and raise our voices to sing and tell Him that we love Him, that we worship Him, and we adore Him. Let's sing this famous song, My Jesus, My Savior, Shout to the Lord.
choose to worship you today. We choose to love you. We choose to rejoice in you this morning. Father, Lord, we do that because you love us. You care for us, Lord. And you are our Savior. You are our comforter. You are our shelter, our helper. You are our hope. Nothing compares to the promises that we have received in you, Lord. Lord, so we thank you, God, today. May you, may you take pleasure in our worship. May you take pleasure in our song. And may you take pleasure in our praise this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning to you all. And welcome to our Sunday online worship service. Uh, today is Mother's Day. And we want to wish all the mothers out there a very happy Mother's Day. Uh, I believe that this period of lockdown has been extra stressful for all the mothers out there, uh, having all the children and all the other family members around the home for 24 hours, demanding this, demanding that. But I believe you have done great. And so we want to thank you for your service, your sacrifice in serving the family, in serving the church, and in serving our society. And we pray that God will continue to bless with all the mothers today. And this service that we have put together, our um, online Mother's Day service, we hope that this service will bless you, uh, that this service will refresh you, and everyone else who is worshiping the Lord together. Uh, when Jesus died on the cross, the Bible tells us that the curtain in the temple split into two from top to bottom, opening up the place in the temple called the Holy of Holies. Now this means that through the blood of Jesus and through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, uh, God has opened up the curtain for us to enter into the very special presence of God. So it doesn't matter where you are, everywhere, wherever we may be, uh, we can enter into the special presence of God through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross and so wherever we may be, you may be at home, you may be uh, somewhere else with your friends, or you may be alone, uh, let us enter into the presence of God uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us enter with confidence, let us enter with joy, uh, so that we will continue to worship the Lord together in this attitude of brokenness and in this attitude of love and worship to God. We have a service that we have put together uh, for us to worship together again. Uh, we have the praise and worship. We have uh, some readings and sharing from some of the children. We have a special song, and we have the, the Word of God, which will be brought to us later. So may the Lord bless you, and as we worship the Lord together, may you feel His presence and feel His powerful love and uh, His Holy Spirit among us. God bless you. First Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Mark 12, 30, 31. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mark 12, 30, 31. Thank you. Today's scripture is taken from Psalm 21 to 5. Psalm 21 to 5. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May you remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. We will shout for joy when you are victorious and will lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 30 and 31. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, 
But the woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Proverbs chapter 31, verses 30 and 31. To all the mothers, I pray these words of hope and comfort to you. I pray to you, Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Happy Mother's Day.
we want to use this time to say a special prayer for our mothers today. And so I want to invite you to join me as I pray uh, for the mothers. Let us look to God in prayer. Most gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, the God who formed us and needed us to get together in our mother's womb. We thank you for all the mothers today. We celebrate this gift of motherhood. We thank you, O oh God, for the gifts that you have given to the mothers of patience, of love, of courage, of their enterprising ventures. We thank you for their prayers. And we pray, O oh God, that you will bless their efforts, bless the work of their hands, answer their prayers so that all of us, our families, our churches, and our society will be blessed through them and because of them. We pray for strength for all the mothers. We pray for health for all the mothers so that they may continue to serve you with joy. And we pray for long life upon them as well that their service and their peace and the joy will be extended as well. We especially pray for the single mothers today who have huge responsibilities and have multiple roles to play. We pray that you will bless them, give them wisdom, peace and strength from above. We pray for those mothers who are sick among us. We pray for your healing hands upon them today so that they will experience healing from you and that they will rise up to serve you, O God, and to testify your name. We commit them to you. We pray, O God, that you will create a, in, in all our mothers a hunger for you, a hunger to seek you in prayer, and a hunger to seek you in your word. We pray that you will bless and equip all the mothers with the passion for you so that they will rise up a godly generation who will serve you. We commit all our mothers into your special care today. Bless them. Our hearts are filled with joy and thanksgiving for them. And we know, Father, that you will bless them and, and um, enrich them and refresh them today. So we pray that you will bless the mothers, use and restore your servants, the mothers today, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. First of all, I would like to take this privilege to wish every mother a very happy Mother's Day. We thank you, Mother, for always being there for us. We thank you for always being our greatest cheerleaders. And who we are today is largely because of your contribution in our lives. We acknowledge that. We honor you. We celebrate you. We treasure you. And we love you. This morning, I would want to talk about a person by the name of Anna Maria Jarvis who is also the founder of Mother's Day. It's been told that, you know, her mom would always express a desire to her that she would want a day to be set aside whereby, we, whereby children could celebrate and honor their mothers. So after the death of her mother, she started a campaign, a movement for this commemoration. And six years after tirelessly working towards it, it was successful when the President of United States then declared the second Sunday of May to be Mother's Day. But it's also been told that, you know, after a few years, she regretted why she started this movement because it became so commercialized that the very essence or the very reason why she wanted Mother's Day to be celebrated was lost and defeated. And so it's also mentioned that, you know, she tried really hard to undo this day, but it was impossible. And so when we celebrate or when we honor our, parent, uh, our mother, let us also keep this at the back of our mind that in the, in the world, you know, like where it has been so commercialized, we do not forget to celebrate our mother for who they are in, their, in our lives. You know, as I was looking for a passage, a cute little story whereby I can talk about Mother's Day, it was very difficult for me to find one. But one thing that I've also found was that hardly women were mentioned in the Bible. 
I don't think it was because they would want to sideline women for any other reason, but it was just that you know, the, the role that women played usually did not feature in the story of God and his relationship with his people, the Israelites. But we also see a few women that, have been, uh, that are mentioned in the Bible. And these women played very crucial roles in the sense that, you know, when God was about to uh, do something new in the life of Israelites, every woman featured then. For example, Sarah, she conceived through a promise of God and she became the mother, you know, the mother of the nations. And then we find, you know, like... Um, uh, Jacobet, the mother of Moses, you know, when the Pharaoh gave an order that all male child should be killed during the birth, but she hid her, but she hid Moses, and we know the story. And then we know, we see we see Esther, you know, coming in, and when all Jews as a race were to be ex- were to be massacred, you know, we see the role of Esther there, and we see that this promise that God gave continued and then we find Mary the mother of Jesus the birth of Messiah and then we find on Easter when a woman was given the news that he was alive and so we know all these stories and so we see that women you know that that are mentioned you know they played crucial roles but they do not somehow you know begin to tell us what the scene of a normal woman was like then and this we find here and there which are implied and suggested, especially like, you know, in the book of Proverbs, where it says, you know, where the author would continue to advise his children by saying, you know, you should take heed to your mother's instruction, which means to suggest that women also, or mothers also play the role in the decision making of their children, or they also nurtured their children, brought them, mentored their children. And then we have some, you know, in Proverbs 14, again, we find where it says, a wise woman builds her house, which means also to imply and suggest that women's domain was in the domestic sphere. It was to take care of the house. And, and not, only the, on that, only, you know, these instances, but we also find, you know, in the imageries that the authors of the Bible would use to describe God, where they would say that, you know, God, uh, especially Isaiah, he would use you know, the imagery of um, mother. And he would say, as a mother comforts her son, so God comforts his people. Or, you know, verses where it says, can a mother forget her nursing child? Can a mother forget the womb of her child? Can she not have compassion on her child? Even if she forgets, I will not forget, for I've graven thee in the palms of my hand. And then we have passages where God, you know, the imagery is used is God as a mother eagle who would gather his children under, his, under her wings. Then we also find passages where it talks about, you know, even Jesus saying, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, who have killed so many prophets, how I would want to gather you like a, like a mother hen would want to gather her cheeks. And so the imageries of mother has been used all throughout the Bible, which gives us, you know, which gives us an understanding to see that um, usually the role that women played was in the domestic sphere. And it was the responsibility of a mother to build the house and to, and to build that to sustain the, the, to sustain the household was also very important in the ancient life of Israel. So in these images that we use, we begin to see that, you know, we begin to uh, understand, like I said, that women's sphere was in the, was, uh, women, uh, women's domain was in the domestic sphere. Now, in the 19th century, you know, with the feminist movement emerging, in the later part of 19th century and in the beginning of 20th century. There was this, uh, uh, to, you know, um, they, the women took upon themselves, or the feminist, or uh, let me just say feminist, they wanted to dissect God or they wanted to, you know, just uh, work on the characteristics of God. And then we see 
the, the, the new thing that was emerging was this, there are feminine characters of God and there are masculine characters of God. Masculine characters being God as a leader, God as a protector, God as mighty, you know, and as a warrior. So this is where the uh, masculine traits, they would say. And the feminine traits of God would be where God is used, you know, uh, uh, where God is used to describe using image, fem, uh, feminine imageries. So they would say, you know, God play God as a comforter, God as a uh, as a nurturer, God as forgiving, God as love, God as always wooing his children. You know, these are the feminine uh, traits of God. And so, if we if we are to you know do that, if we are to dissect God and say these are the masculine and these are feminine, you know, they go on to say that it is all right to address God as mother because, you know, the very reason you know, or the very reason that draws or attracts men to, uh, to God are some of the feminine traits that we talk about God. For example, when we say, you know, we say we thank God because, you know, he's so loving, he's so forgiving, he's always there, he woos us, he comforts us, he nourishes us, he nurtures us. So we all, always talk about that. So if we say to it, yes, for many, if we are to say these are the feminine and these are the masculine, for many, they will be able to relate God better as a mother. And so don't get me wrong here. I, in the very first place, you know, I would not want God to be dissected in this way, you know, uh, being gender being the criteria. But if we really, and I was thinking to myself, you know, when we say we celebrate our mothers, these are usually the traits or the uh, qualities that we talk about our mother. And we thank them for what they, for the role that they play in our lives. And this we can easily identify with our mothers. And so this made me think, you know, because we live in a fallen world. You know, everyone does not have their biological mother. Some have lost their mothers. And so for some, Mother's Day is a day, is a very sad day for them, where they grieve the loss of their mothers, and it becomes very difficult for them to celebrate. But mind you, even Anna Jarvis, you know, she celebrated Mother's Day after the death of her mother, after the death of the mother. She continued this movement. And so it doesn't matter whether living or that, but we honor and we celebrate their contribution in our lives. But for some, it could be the sister, or it could be the uncle, or it could even be the father or the, uh, or the grandparents playing that role, providing that maternal love, providing that maternal care, or it could be a mother figure in your life. And so this is a day where we do not just restrict and say we, worship, we celebrate our biological mothers, but it is a day where we celebrate these people in our lives who have given us maternal love. And so they are all included in this celebration. And as we honor them, I would want you all to include them, to acknowledge these people in your lives who have played the role of a mother. Now, when we talk about this, like I said, we cannot just restrict them to mothers. For example, you know, there are children who have been adopted. And I love this, uh, you know, this quote by Shushmita Sen's daughter who would say that, you know, what is of the natural is boring. What is special is born from the heart. I'm born of the heart. I am special. It's a choice that they make. And so we need to acknowledge and honor and celebrate these mothers or mother figures in our lives, a more comfortable saying mother figures in our lives. Now, what is the role of these mothers in our lives? Also, let me just use parents. I would really want to emphasize more on, you know, uh, talk about a family. You know, we are blessed with children and children are blessed to have parents and together we make a family. Now, in, you know, like when we do, uh, when we do, uh, mm, a dissertation, when we write dissertations or when we do projects, you know, the, 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 uh, the subject, you know, is so broad that we have to narrow it down. And so how do we narrow it down? We, we have a very, uh, we call it the scope of limitation, where we limit our area of study. And when we say that area of study, we come up with a very broad aim. And this broad aim, and under this broad aim, we have a few objectives. We call it the aim and objective. Aim, ob aim being the broad aim and the objectives being, you know, um, uh, being... Uh, 
of, again, you know, being more specific, being more specific, and which helps us in contributing to the, to the broader aim that we have. And so this, uh, what, I, what I'm trying to say is, see, we are parents. You know, like I said, I would want to address this to parents. We are parents, and not only parents, but we are Christian parents. We are Christian parents. And so for me, as I, you know, as I would want to begin my uh, sharing today, it's not based on one particular verse, but I would want to make a, take a broad sweep over this, uh, especially building the, kingdom of, building the kingdom of God as the broad aim and as one of the objectives as we will be looking into as building our homes in the principles of the kingdom of God. Now, the first thing you know, that I would want to talk about today is this, you know, I, I, uh, the concept of calling or the understanding of calling. You know, the apostles and uh, in, in, when we look into the history of Christianity, calling was for everyone. Everyone who says that they are children of God, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this calling is for all of us. But, and this calling is for all Christians, but in, in the, uh, you know, like a, a time came when, you know, they have, they have spiritualized and they have narrowed the, the meaning of the word calling. And they, uh, and, and they said calling was only for those people who were called into full-time ministry. And so the, the, the word calling was restricted only to those people who were called for, first, uh, for uh, full-time ministry. But thanks that the reformation movement, uh, the, reformation, uh, the reformation movement rediscovered it. And they said, calling is for all. Anyone who says that they're a child of God, you know, this is a calling or this is a vocation for us. And so when we say we, we are into different jobs or we are into different things, this is your calling from God. And so, it, so the concept of calling is not very difficult to understand. It's not about, you know, anything, but it's not complicated. It's just that, it depends who is the caller. So it was, you know, uh, when they rediscovered it, they said calling is not a calling to a place or, you know, a calling to do something, but a call is, uh, you know, is, is a call by someone. And, it's a, and, and this call is by someone. So as parents, as mother figures, you know, there is a calling for us. And that is to be parents. Now, when we say, you know, as parents, our, um, what do you call, our effective range of influence could not be very wide. But when it comes to our family, you know, children look up to us as role models. They look up to us as leaders, you know. And, and that's where we can exercise our effective range of influence. You know, that's our effective range of influence. This family that, uh, and that family that is established in love. And that is our calling, that we are to raise or bring up our children in the kingdom, uh, using the kingdom principles. The first that, like I said, you know, that I would really want to talk about is this calling is from God. And when we say this calling is from God, it means to say that God chose us. It was God who chose us. And when we say that, there are three things, you know, in the light of family that I would want to talk about. You know, I get very uh, sad when, you know, uh, we talk like, uh, when we say, you know, like uh, very carelessly, especially, uh, okay, let me not name it, but as, uh, when we talk very carelessly about, you know, um, parenthood, like the example that I'll be giving. You know, uh, Sometimes we judge people based on the fact that there are some mothers who cannot conceive. And, and we kind of judge them and we feel sorry for them. Yes, we do that. But I would want to say this, that this could be a call from God. This could be a call from God. And I'm reminded of a story where, you know, it's told that uh, th there was this couple who, you know, adopted, who adopted a child. And this child wanted to be, uh, wanted to go back to his parents. And, and so in, in, in a conversation, uh, the adopted son begins to say that, you know, I'm so sorry that you could not conceive, you know, you could not conceive uh, children of your own. And at that time, the mother says, no, it's not that I cannot conceive. It's just that I chose not to conceive because there are so many children without parents. And I chose that I would be a mother. 
you know, to those children. And even that, that adopted son was shocked to learn that. But he found love in that, you know. And so for some, it's a choice. Yes, for some, yes, it, 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 it's something that's beyond our control. And so I would want to say, yes, but there is no room for us to judge. It is a call. It is the caller who calls us. And therefore, it is so important for us to respond to that call. If God has placed people under your care where God wants you to play the role of parents, I would really encourage you to do so. I would really encourage you to do so. The second thing that I would want to talk about is we live in a patriarchal society and a male child, you know, it becomes the most important thing when it comes to a patriarchal society. And we find a lot of people, you know, who doesn't have a male child. And people would just comment, you know, carelessly about so many things. And so I say to those people, you know, who would make uh, such comments, I would say, is it, is it within your control or within your power to determine the sex of the baby? Had it been so, everyone would be doing. But what is not beyond, what is not within our control, what is beyond our control is God's doing. And therefore, we have no right to judge people based on that. When, when special children are born to parents, you know, we hear careless comments here and there. But we need to know that what is beyond our control, God has a hand in it. And therefore, we need to respond to that call that comes from the caller, and that is Jesus Christ. When we say we are Christian parents, it is so important for us not to be careless with our words, but to, but to know this. And there, there is also instances where, you know, uh, women or men who, who choose not to marry, people will, people will begin to say, who's going to take care of you after you die? You need your children, as if children are an investment. You know? And so we talk in terms of that. And we live in a world where economy is so important. And so everything, we try to look from that perspective, from that lens. And so we begin to say, who's going to take care of you after you know, become old? As Christians, we believe that God is going to take care of us. As Christians, we know these children that God has given us, they are under our care. And God is going to hold us responsible as to how we bring up and raise up this child. If God has given you, you know, children which are not of your own, but God has given you to play a role in their lives, so be it, the caller. And so when we perform in this world, it says, when, 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 we, respond to the, when we respond to the call of the caller, it is always to the audience of one that we live out our lives. And this is so important as Christians, as, as Christians to, re, to, rem, to remind ourselves of that, that it is God who chose us, God placed us wherever we are, as difficult as it is for us to understand, leave it to God. And take it as a call from God and respond to that caller and know that we live to the audience of one. And when we do that, we are oblivious to the noises and the voices around us. But we know that when it comes to building the kingdom of God, the first thing that we need to remind ourselves is it is God who chose us. The second thing that I would want to talk about is the so-called, you know, like uh, when Reformation, you know, they, they, they rediscovered this, um, this concept of calling. They said the first thing is we need to remind ourselves that it is God who has called us and God has called us to a relationship with him. The second thing that he tells, uh, the second thing that they brought about was in, in, in this concept of calling is we need to live by his will. You know, we need to live by what he tells us to, by what God tells us to. Now, that's the, that's the kingdom of God. How do we contribute to it? How do we contribute to it? Now, the second um, thing that I would want to talk about is one of the qualities that we always talk about when it comes to our mothers, and that is sacrificial love. The love that our mothers have for us is so sacrificial, you know. I remember, you know, for, uh, I remember, you know, before I had children, you know, I would follow my own schedule. I would make appointments and I would do things, you know, the way that I would want it to. But with, when, when my children, you know, when my children came to the scene, it was so difficult for me to follow a schedule. I, you know, it, their schedule became my schedule. And I still remember a time when I was so, you know, I was so fit and fine and, you know, I could go to my workplace and work, but I didn't have a helper then. And so when I didn't have a helper, I had to take care of my children. My children were also very healthy. But 
I had to juggle between these two and it was so difficult and it was impossible for me to work from home also because I had to go to the field and you know um, uh, listen to them, counsel them, pray for them and, and, this, and this we cannot do from home. And so I had, to, I had to make a choice and the choice was to stay home and to take care of my children. And in the process of doing this over and over again, you know, it so happened that till date, my whole schedule revolves around my children's schedule. Everything depends on them. And so if I have to take leave from work as much as work is important for the sake of my children, I would have to, you know, uh, as much as I don't want to, I would have to, you know, neglect my work. So children becomes the center, you know, they, they become the center and, we, and our world revolves around them. And only then I began to realize that even, it, it was even so with my mother or with my parents. It was the same thing. And so when, when their lives, you know, revolves around us, there is a tendency for us to take love for granted. We expect that mothers should always be there and so they're there for us. And so I would also urge children here, you know, if you're listening to this, I would urge you to really acknowledge the contribution of your mothers, you know, of your mothers. It is so important to acknowledge because your mother or, or your mother figure or, you know, have contributed so much in your life. And it is, you know, it is very necessary for us to acknowledge and say thanks to our parents or to the mother figure or you know or to our mother but i would just use the word mother but it means mother figure or it could be your parents and so i think you will begin and and so it's difficult for me to you know use that word again and again so i would just use the word mother here and and so it is very important to acknowledge to our parents you know or else if you don't do you know sometimes we develop a sense of entitlement and where we think they should always be there for us and we take their love for granted and i'm reminded in the bible even us you know as we play the role of parents we are also children when it comes to god you know and i would want to draw this parallelism also where we see god and where we in the light of god we are his children and when it comes to our parents we play the role of parents now it is so important to acknowledge because you know the very thing if we do not develop this grateful heart if we do not acknowledge the contribution of those people around us you know who have showered us with love what happens is we become hard hearted we begin to say develop a sense of entitlement and it is the same with God. It is the same with God. And so when we say, you know, when you pray, the, the first thing that we do is we start with praising God. We say, thank you, Lord, for what you have done for me. Thank you, Lord, for you are good. Thank you, Lord, for you are this and this and this and so on. And so it is so important to acknowledge our gratitude. And so children, wherever you are, make it, you know, make it a point that you acknowledge the contribution of your parents in your life. And saying this, I would also want to say the sacrificial love that we talk about. This is one, you know, where, you know, uh, um, the love that, I mean, like, it comes so naturally. It comes so naturally. And I was, you know, reminded of this where, you know, my daughter would shy away from performing in public places. And, you know, she would just shy away. And even if she knows it very well, somehow she feels very uncomfortable in front of people, you know. And so I gave her this tip. I, I told her, See, there are so many people watching, but I would want you to know that everyone's eyes is only on their children. It's only on their children. And so, as people are oblivious, you know, as people are oblivious to your existence, know that, be oblivious to them also, and know that you're only performing for your mom and dad. And, and you know, and that's true. Everyone's eyes, everyone's camera is only on their children even if there's a large group of people there. Why? Because they are the apple of our eye. And we would want everyone to, you know, love our children like the way we love them. This is what parents do all the time. You know, they are the apple of our eye. They are the very reason why we exist. And so there is a tendency in us, you know. And so with so much of love, you know, within us, it gives us energy to, you know, to begin our day, to end our day, whatever it is. But it, you know, it excites us. And it is a joy for us to revolve our life around our children. 
But, you know, as I looked into this, I found this, you know, and, it, and I found it very interesting that the, 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 the mother's role is to nurture. And, you know, sometimes we understand the meaning of a word and we don't really look into it. But I made it a point that I would want to look it in, in the dictionary. And as I looked, I found out that nurture and uh, nourish, they come, uh, uh, they come from the same root word, same root word, nitrire, a Latin root word, nitrire, which means, you know, to, to take care of someone, you know, to take care of someone or to take care in the development of a person. You know, and it's so interesting that nurture is synonym to nourish. And so it says, you know, the example of a nurture is a, a, a parent, parent raising their children or the other one was, you know, providing a balanced meal. And that caught my attention. Now I say, what is a balanced meal? You know, and a balanced meal is, you know, where um, you have uh, one of the, where it includes uh, one, one food from all, the, from all the groups, from all the food groups. So all the food groups, what are the food groups? The food groups are uh, dairy products, uh, fruits, vegetables, grains, and proteins. And so it includes one food from all this group that is called a balanced meal. And so I was thinking, you know, as, as if we have this at the back of our mind, you know, when we prepare food for our children or when we want to keep them healthy, when we follow this, then it would be, you know, easier for us to be, you know, in, uh, to be providing them with the right food so that they grow healthy. Likewise, you know, as we look in our world today, we know about balanced meal, we know that it's a healthy food, and yet, you know, there are so many food around us that is such a distraction, and we call it the junk food. And I want you to know what the junk food, you know, the, the composition of the junk food. And it says that junk food is mostly, you know, it's very high in calories, and it's uh, very high in fat. And a little of minerals, vitamins, and proteins is there. But then, you know, they say it's so difficult to pin, pin down and say this is junk food. But one thing they all agree, all nutritionists agree, that junk food is harmful for health. But it's so tasty and we crave for it, you know. And so unless and until we understand this, you know, most of the time out of laziness or with so many things to do, you know, we usually feed our children with junk food. And unless and until we begin to see, you know, externally they begin to manifest some symptoms, we never take them to a doctor and we continue to feed them the junk food. And that's, and that's how, you know, life goes about. And so in this, I was reminded of this. Now, what could be a balanced meal when it comes to you know, to our spiritual life. And like this junk food that is around us, that is so attractive, that is so tasty, that can keep our children so happy. And we are also very happy because they are happy. You know, the one thing that I came to realize is, you know, as Christians, as Christians, we need to know who we are. You know, the first point is so important in this. We need to know who we are. I love one thing about Paul the Apostle is this. In all of his letters, as he begins his letter, he would always, you know, go on uh, telling us or confirm us about who we are in Christ. You are more than conquerors. You know, you, uh, you have an inheritance in Christ. You are, you, are, you know, you, uh, Christ has already won the, uh, won the victory for us. So we always start from a victory, you know, from a victory point, you know. And so all these things Paul would go on to say of who we are in Christ. And in the book of Ephesians, you know, uh, um, towards the end of Ephesians, he says, stand firm in the light of all this, knowing that who you are, knowing that your inheritance is in God. You know, and the spirit seals, you know, and he's the guarantor of our inheritance. He begins to say, but stand firm. Because, and then he tells us what? He said, put on the full armor of God. Why do we need to put on the full armor of God? Because he said, we have an enemy. And you know, it's interesting to know this. Many Christians, you know, the, they say that, you know, uh, the enemy, so-called the devil, or the enemy, you know, I would, I would prefer to use the word enemy here. Enemies, what they do is, they don't want us to recognize him. You know, they just don't, uh, he, he doesn't want us to recognize him. Because he knows who he is. He knows who we are. He knows that we are children of God. He knows that he's a defeated foe. He knows it so well, but he doesn't want us to know. And so he has, what does the word say? The word say that he schemes. And what do we, when you hear the word scheme, what, what comes to your mind? 
Scheming is pre-planning. You know, they pre-plan. Scheming doesn't happen accidentally. They have studied you and, you know, and that's how they scheme. And what do, how do you scheme about? It's always to know, you know, uh, where your weaknesses are. And so I was reminded again, you know, I was watching a, 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 a short clip, you know, with my children. I was watching a cartoon a show and then it was about mini fours. And in that very scene that we were watching, we see that, you know, uh, there, are four, there are four characters and they were being attacked by the enemy. And so there was this band of turtles and they decided to help the, uh, the mini fours. And so they came and then, you know, they, they, they came together, the turtles came together and they formed a kind of shield. And so whatever the enemy was, you know, throwing at them, it, it did not, you know, it did not somehow pass through the, uh, the four characters. And so they had planned to strategize how to go about and so this, this, uh, these characters, what they did was, they, they started also, you know, uh, throwing their powers or, uh, to the enemy, but somehow, you know, it did not make any difference. And so they decided, no, this is, the, this is his strength. And so we need to know where his weaknesses are. And so they studied his weaknesses and they found that the weaknesses was in the heart. And so what did they do? The next time they focused all their energy only in the, in the heart. And that was how the enemy was defeated. And so what I want to say is, you know, there are so many things around us and we have the power and the potential to do so many things. But I would want to say, choose your battles where, well. We need to invest our energy in the right places. And as the Bible says that there is an enemy, we need to be aware of the schemes of the devil. Now, so in the light of this, how do we build our lives around this. You know, I was reminded again of my sister, you know, when she was studying in Delhi, she would say, I don't think devils exist in cities. You know, uh, because, you know, for many of us, devils are those lurking in the dark and always trying to disturb our sleep, you know. It's so scared to sleep near the window because we think that the devil will just pounce on us. And we talk about stories where, you know, we couldn't sleep at night. And so we limit the devil to only that. And so, you know, it's easier for us to say that, you know, there are no devils in the cities. And so the, and the, 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 what do you call? The aim of the enemy is to distract us from recognizing him. It is to distract us from recognizing him. When I was doing a study on this uh, uh, junk food, I came across a word that says sugar. And there's a word called hidden sugar. You know, and it's amazing. And he says, the nutritionist has to say this. What, the, what, what is the function of the hidden sugar? What the hidden sugar do, does is, the hidden sugar, it, it, the moment it, 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 um, the moment it goes inside your body, it turns into sugar. But it's hidden, you don't see it. So he said, how do you identify this sugar? How do you identify these hidden sugars? And this is what he has to say. When you look out for the composition for any you know, uh, item that you are buying, make sure, uh, watch out for those words that end with the word O-S-E. Example, fructose, you know, O-S-E, or malt, or syrup. And if you see this, know that they are hidden sugars. They may not all be hidden sugars, but this you know, is, a, is how we identify that they are hidden sugars. And the other thing about artificial, artificial sweetener, this is what they have to say. Artificial sweetener doesn't, you know, give you calories, but what it does is it, you know, brings about a craving for real sugar in your life. And it's amazing how it's hidden so well, you know, in that. And so for us to know, you know, for us, it is so important to recognize the enemy in our lives. And we need to be aware of the schemes. Now, Paul does not just mention that there is an enemy and then, you know, his schemes to, uh, you know, his schemes uh, and in such a way that we will never recognize him. But, you know, the Bible talks about putting on the full armor of God. And so we need to build our homes around this truth, the belt of truth that the Bible talks about, the sword of the word of God, you know, uh, righteousness as your breastplate, a uh, helmet of salvation, you know, faith, you know, and feet that carries the message of peace. And so peace, truth, righteousness, you know, the word, and all of this, not only that, but even prayer. And prayer is so essential. What is prayer? And this is something that we can, you know, very, we can even go wrong with prayer. Sometimes we assume that prayer is just that, you know, posture where we kneel down and pray and that's it. No, it's not so. Prayers should change our lives. We should work on our prayers. Just imagine, you know, praying and praying and praying. You spend four, four, four or five hours praying. And the moment you wake up, you start scheming. You start lying. You start cheating. 
that is not, you know, and so Satan can even fool us by saying that this is just a religious, this is a, just a ritual that we do. And so prayer means prayer changes us. Prayer helps us to recognize our enemies, the schemes of the devil in our lives. And so we need to build our home around this truth, around these kingdom principles. It's so important, and that is how we identify our enemy. But it is so important for us to know that it is our enemy, and he wants us to live a defeated life. He doesn't want us to recognize who we are. And so we have so many junk food around us. Like I said, even when it comes to spiritually, you know, there's so many things around us. It is only this that will keep us, help us to identify the enemy around us and know that whatever it is, we are victorious in Christ. And we always uh, uh, choose our battle from a position of victory. Now, the third thing that I would want to talk about is this, is what is the most important thing? We need to lead by examples. Integrity is so important. You know, uh, in, in Psalm 78, it says that God chose David and, you know, David shepherded. David was a shepherd and he shepherded with integrity of heart and with skillful hands. And this is so important, you know. As children, you know, the third point that the, uh, that the Reformation movement talks about is we we live our lives we live our lives in such a way that is so attractive that it brings others even to Christ people who have not heard of Christ to come to come to this family and so when we say this it uh, it says that we bear the name of God we bear the name of God just as our children bears our name we bear the name of God and so in the light of this, we begin to see that, you know, um, God is for us at all times. And God, you know, like uh, when our children, you know, the first, uh, the, the first time they, we ask them, what is your mother's name? What is your father's name? And they, you know, and they're able to uh, say our names. You know, we feel so happy, you know. We would record that and we would send it to people and we would say, now our children knows, you know, our names. And they would bear our name and it would be such a joy for us when they go around and say that they, you know, they are our children, you know, and everyone has experienced that, I believe. And so uh, in, in the light of this, we also bear God's name, you know. Uh, there's a scholar by the name of Carmen Imes, an Old Testament scholar, and, he wrote, and she wrote a book called uh, Bearing God's Name. And there uh, in her thesis, uh, she worked on the second commandment that God gave, which is uh, the second commandment which God gave was, um, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. And many of us, we assume that this is to do with verbal, where we have, whereby we are not allowed to swear or so. But they say, if we are to translate it very well, then it has to be, we do not bear the name of the Lord in vain. It is about, you know, just not speech, not just limited to speech, but it's about our entire life, you know. And so the gospel calls us to be people of integrity. You know, we do not lead by giving advices to people, by preaching, but we lead our lives. You know, we lead our lives by integrity, by who we are. It is so important. And so even God gave a call to the Israelites to say, saying that you are the light to the nations. Now, when we come to the laws, you know, many people assume that, the, you know, the laws were a prerequisite to salvation. But it was never so. When we read the history, when we read the Bible, you know, we begin to realize that um, it was God who redeemed them. It was God who saved them from slavery, brought them from slavery. And in the light of this, God gave his commandments. And I believe every home, as much as you love your children, you are also, you have certain rules and regulations. You live by certain codes in your own family. Likewise, even God has this for us to live by the laws. And one interesting thing that I learned from Carmen Eins is this. You know, when it comes to Jeremiah, where we talks about the new covenant, where God says, you know, that God is going to uh, bring about, renew, to, to bring about a new covenant. You know, and even Ezekiel talks about a heart of flesh. You know, God will take the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. You know, God nowhere talks about the covenant, but what he talks about is the heart, is the heart. And, and, and therefore, our hearts, you know, and God, you know, through his son Jesus, you know, paying the price for us, redeeming us. He gives us a heart that can follow him. It give, it God gives us a heart that we can keep his laws. You know, as God's people, we live by this. And God, you know, gave this law where he said, the whole law is summed up in this. 
You know, love, your, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, the whole thing was summed up in that. And God said, and, and Jesus said, by your love for one another, people will know that you are my disciples. It is love. We follow those because of love. Not because that, you know, oh, to be a part of this family, I have to do this, I have to do that. Only then I can be a part of this family. No, you are already a part of this family. But we also have certain rules or certain codes that we live by as a family. And it is so important. Likewise, God has also given us this call and we need to lead by examples. You know, we live in a society where, you know, social media has just taken over. And we have Instagram, we have Facebook. And so everyone, you know, would want to portray their best in everything. As far as skill is concerned, people would want to hone their skills, would want to know, you know, would want to work on their talents, you know. And sometimes if we are not very careful, it could be driven by this philosophy that, you know, we would want to impress people. And so we would develop on our skills, but not with the integrity of heart. You know, and so this is what, you know, someone said, you know, as parents, we would want our children to get into, to, you know, uh, uh, to get as much skills, you know, as they can. And so we would send them for this, that tuition or that training or whatever so that our children are skilled and equipped, you know, in this world. But it is so important to, you know, give them the kingdom principles and, and, and bring them up and raise them up with integrity. And with integrity, basically what I mean is by us as a model, as an example, by living out our lives. Because this is what D.L. Moody said when, you know, there was, a, there was a thief that would steal around the railway station. And so people say, no, the problem is education. We need to educate that person. And Dil Moody says, if we educate that person without, without you know, we, if we just educate him, the next time he would even steal the train away. You know? Or for a, for a lawyer, you know, a skillful lawyer without integrity is a very dangerous lawyer. So when we give them the skills, but we don't teach them or we don't raise them up with integrity of heart, give them that integrity, it is impossible. It is impossible. And therefore, my call, and as I look at our, as I look at our uh, society today, I believe that we are failing in our society because it, is, it has become so difficult for us to live by examples. But the call is upon us to lead by example. And I would want to make this call, you know. I would want everyone to take this very seriously. You know, I, I, I am one person who speaks so loudly, you know. And when I say, like, have you taken your food also? I, I sound very angry, you know. And, and sometimes my daughter would imitate me. And she would, you know, talk like, you know, in the manner that I talk. And I would be so hurt and I would say, okay. And so I told my daughter, now we have to make uh, this thing. Now, uh, now what, we, what you and I will do is we will try to talk softly. You know, and this is one of the things that we are working on at the moment to talk softly. Because even if I say something, it's it's so rough that it sounds like as if I'm angry. You know, and and so people would say, "Why are you so angry?" But actually, it's it, it's not. It, I'm not you know angry, but it's just the way I speak. You know, and it doesn't help. And so you know, no matter what I tell my children, talk softly, whatever it is. Since I speak loudly, and when I when I don't remember, you know, I, I talk the way that I talk. You know, they are influenced by that. They are influenced by that. So I would always tell my husband, you know, one thing that I would want to give our children is this. They need to know where our you know, source of strength or source of joy comes from. Because when they face life, they're going to face problems in life. They're going to go through trouble times. And at that point of time, they would always, always bank on our source and our strength. They would always bank on that. So as a family, if, if you bank on money for everything, your children would also want to bank on money. No matter what you say, they, they learn, they see, you know, they see what we do and they learn by it. Because mind it, we are the role models. They think that we are heroes. But integrity has nothing to do with perfection, but it is to do with, you know, a see-throughness. What you say is who you are. It is so important when you, when you say, you know, when you do something wrong, it is so important to apologize instead of putting the blame on people. 
It is so important to do this by the kingdom principles, knowing that we, that we serve to an audience of one, knowing who is the caller in our lives, knowing that he has placed us to do his will, knowing that he has called us to bear his name. And so the prayer that we always pray, hallowed be your name. It doesn't mean that, you know, when we, when we do that, God is going to become holy. God is already holy, but what we do is we guard the reputation of God. We guard the reputation of God. So when we say, hallowed be your name, we are saying that yes, in this light, Lord, I would, you know, I would, I would want people to see that I represent you in everything that I do. And that is so important, my dear friends. And so in the light of this, it is by examples that we live. No family is perfect. All of us, I think, there's always room for improvement. And so I would want to urge all of us to Contribute to the building of the kingdom of God by taking, by nurturing this family that God has given us, which is established in love. And let us not, you know, do it in our will, but let us take God and continue to guide our children by kingdom principles. And so this very day, I would want to remind us that there is a call before us. And this call is to raise godly children, to raise, to bring about godly families. I love this song, you know, I think it's of Steve Green, which says, may they find us faithful. And only as we lead by integrity, people will see that, yes, we love Jesus, we belong to him, we bear his name, and we do not misrepresent him, but we, you know, honor his name, and we say, as we pray, hallowed be your name. May God be hallowed in and through our lives, and also in and through our families. God bless us. Shall we look to God in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, We thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for this beautiful day that you have set aside for us, whereby, Lord, we can honor and celebrate our mothers and our mother figures in our lives. Thank you, O Lord Jesus, that we have seen so much of you, Lord, in and through our mothers, Lord. Bless them, Lord, and continue to, Father, bless them with good health and long life, Lord. And may they leave, Lord, to tell your story, Lord, wherever they are, Lord Jesus. And I just pray that you bless them with your special grace, Lord, even this day. Lord, as families, Lord, young it may be, Lord, uh, as we raise our families, Lord, as parents, Lord Jesus. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom, Lord, in our lives. And we pray that, God, you will empower us, O Lord Jesus, to live lives of integrity, Lord, to live lives, O Lord Jesus, by example, Lord Jesus. Father, help us to know that God, help us to know that we, Father, raise our homes, O Lord Jesus. And in raising our homes, we contribute, O Father, to building the kingdom of God. Thank you once again, Father, for this call upon our lives. Father, this is a privilege, O Lord, and this is challenging, Lord. And we cannot do it by ourselves, Lord. I thank you for your word that comforts us by saying, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit alone. And so Holy Spirit, we ask of you to empower us, to strengthen us, and to help us in our walk as we, Father, give ourselves to building our homes in the light of contributing to the kingdom of God. Bless our homes, bless our lives, bless our children wherever they are, Lord. May your protection be ever upon them, Lord. And continue to speak to them, Lord. And continue to bless them, O Lord Jesus. That they may grow to know who they are in you. And they may grow to love you. And their lives in turn, O Lord Jesus, will respond, O Lord, to the caller, Lord. And, they, and we will all desire to leave to the audience of one. So bless us together. We commit, Lord, our parents, O Lord Jesus, our loved ones to you. For we offer this prayer with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us all sing this hymn together.
thank God for the time that we have had. I believe all of us have been blessed. And uh, please do join us again uh, the coming Sunday to worship the Lord again in this manner. We want to encourage you, wherever you may be, to spend some time in prayer. And we want to, as we have heard in the message, propose just three prayer points. Firstly, uh, pray that we will be faithful to the calling that God has placed upon our lives. All of us have a calling, wherever we may be. All of us, God has play, called us and equipped us and placed us wherever we are to make an impact uh, for Him. So let us pray that, that we will be true to the calling that um, God has given to us. Secondly, let us pray that we will live according to the principles of the kingdom of God, wherever we may be. And thirdly, let us pray that we will faithfully bear the name of Jesus Christ wherever we are and whatever we may do. So with these three prayer points, we want to request you, wherever you may be and whoever you may be with, to spend some time in prayer. I pray that we will be true to his calling. Pray that we will continue to live according to the principles of the kingdom of God and pray that we will faithfully bear the name of Jesus Christ wherever we may be and whatever we do. So God bless you and uh, thank you.